Hello, friends. I, lo I, lo I love that, that, that greeting. That, that greeting is from Jim Nance. Jim Nance, he uh, is an announcer for CBS Sports, and particularly he does all the golfing uh, things by like places like from Augusta National for the Masters and the like. But, you know, Jesus calls us to be friends, and so here we are in part two, part two of our uh, little observation, a little sharing about our facility. Now we talk about some of the, the things that are part of the Mass. But before we get that, for one of a, a phrase, the most important thing in Mass is you. It's the people of God. You know, and, and we come together as God's people. And every one of us is important to making up that community of faith, of hope, and love that we're called to be. And obviously when we, we come to church, we come to Mass, if you will, on the weekend, whether it be Saturday or Sunday. And of course, during this uh, pandemic, uh, some of us, many of us, are unable to be in church for any number of reasons. And so we, we watch the, the Mass uh, via live streaming, which we live stream every week here at 1030 Sunday. Where do we begin? Well, there's so much. I think the first thing we'll start with is what we call the vestments. These are things that particularly the priest wears, but uh, other people may wear them too. And, and so uh, the, the first thing that the priest or even the deacon, and uh, you know, the deacon, you know, he, he's not a priest. He's not a priest. The deacon is ordained minister. He can do many of the things a priest can do. But he can, he can baptize, he can witness weddings, he can lead prayer services. However, when it comes to the Mass, only a priest can preside at Mass, be the leader of the Mass. When it comes to the Sacrament of Reconciliation, confession, only a priest can hear confessions and absolve sin. And anointing of the sick, that sacrament for those who are advanced in years to whatever degree, sick or even dying, uh, is a sacrament that only a priest can administer uh, at that time. But when we come to church, we, we have other ministers besides the deacon who uh, assist the priest in a variety of ways, his ministry of service. We have people, when you come into church, the greeters. We have ushers. We have people who read the Word of God, the Scriptures. We have people who assist with the distribution of Eucharist, not only in church, but in bringing communion to people at home, the Eucharistic ministers. We have people who are called servers, could be of any age. We have the music ministry, and we, we, we have in this parish also the, the tech ministry. And I'm sure there's probably a ministry or two that uh, I, I haven't uh, mentioned. But these are people who are serving God's people in a particular way when we gather at Mass. But of course, as I said, the community, all of us, is as important. Because when we're here, we're here to participate fully in, in prayer and in worship of our God and to give support to one another. So before Mass begins, normally you wouldn't see this, but you'll see uh, the priest or deacon particularly wearing what's called an alb. You know, the, these vestments go back, you know, to a different time and different era. And, and so this covers a multitude of sins. <laughs> it's a white, it's white. Reminds you, if you will, of our baptismal garment. When, you know, we put on this garment, we're clothed in Christ, clothed with Christ. So they come in all, you know, different types of albs. Um, this one you know, has a small collar. Some have a cowl where you can put it over your head. And then, then uh, there's a, a stole. A stole. This, this for the priest is the, the, the priest symbol of authority. And uh, this is one that's more festive. And it goes over the, the neck of the, the priest and uh, hangs down on either side. The deacon also wears a stole, but he wears his differently. He wears it over his shoulder, and it drapes on the other side something like this. And that signifies that he's a deacon um, you know, in the church versus a priest. 
The other vestment that you would see um, the priest wear is what's called the chasuble. Now the chasubles come in in different colors, you know, and, and they correspond to maybe special situations in the life of the church, the liturgical year as it's called, but, um, and we don't wear them all, all the time. Beginning in the, the beginning of the year, the first um, uh, liturgical season that we have, which is just before Christmas, we call Advent. And so the, the color that's used for Advent would be, you know, purple, a purple color. You know, four, four weeks of preparing for the coming of the Lord. Uh, remembering that it was a long, long wait, thousands of years before the Messiah came at what we call Christmas. Over, over, I'll, I'll put this one on. It's almost like a fashion show, isn't it? <laughs> now, the, the, this, this, the chasuble I, I put on, uh, there's a, what's called the stole, as I mentioned before. The stole can be worn one of two ways. Uh, most of the time, because of the, the, the design that was made for these, the stole uh, I wear over the chasuble. Now, you'll see other priests, uh, other liturgical designs, would have the stole underneath the, the chasuble, and you may or may not see it. We then, after um, <clears throat> the, the, the waiting of Lent, uh, of Advent rather, we prepare for Christmas, but Christmas is more than a day. It's several weeks from Christmas, and so we, we celebrate. It's a major feast, if you will. And uh, we, we move from the purple color, To the white color. Now, again, you, you can have different designs on these. Uh, this is uh, this is a plain white. You know, we have other uh, albs or other chasubles rather that have some other designs. They're whitish in color. They might have more <coughs> sort of you know this type of color where they're more festive, and this could even be worn. Uh, over this, you know. Uh, this is a, a very simple white, you know, that could be worn that way. This is an interesting uh, uh, stole. It's reversible. Reversible. Um, and sometimes a priest, he'll just wear it uh, like this. He might not wear even uh, a, a chasuble. Uh, this would suffice. After um, the Christmas season, several weeks, we enter into, for a couple of uh, weeks at least, could be a little longer depending on the liturgical year, into what's called ordinary time. You can't, you can't have big celebrations all the time, although we'd like to. We get tired. And so we need to calm down and we, we, we have a, 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 a little more, less of a celebration. And so green would be the time for ordinary time. Um, green stole, there's over here. The reason I left this, and you'll find out is in a second why I left it over here. We have red stoles, or red chasubles. And um, red is um, a color that we don't wear a lot. Um, we wear it for Pentecost. Uh, we wear it for certain uh, feast days. Uh, but it, it's rare that we wear it. And again, as I said, um, you could get a little Christmassy with it if you wanted to, the green and red. But there is a red, this is another reversible stall that you could be used. And then we have, choose your color, I guess we would call this rose, some people call it pink. This is worn, or could be worn, twice a year. It can be worn during the season of Advent, Gaudete Sunday, and we'll talk about that in a second. Or we could wear it for Laudete Sunday, which both of which are 
in the middle of two liturgical seasons. Gaudete, third week of Advent. Latare, fourth week of Lent. And really what it means is rejoice. We rejoice during Advent knowing that the Lord is coming, the Lord is you know, being born in a sense, or was born. And then during uh, Lent, we rejoice that Christ the Lord is indeed not, is going to rise and share with us eternal life. And so, so, so these are, are the vestments that we wear. Uh, you might see sometimes our servers wear uh, something similar to what I'm wearing. Um, you know, again, sign of their baptismal garment and they are service, serving our, the community. Something new with the um, on, onset of uh, the, the COVID, uh, we've come across some masks that now match the liturgical color. You know, Father has to look good. <laughs> and so, uh, here's a pink, or a pink one, yeah, purple one. You know, not too bad. Um, in the color, you have a white one, we have a green one, we have a red one. Okay. So, um, those are something that uh, hopefully we won't be wearing too much longer. Other things we see in church would be the cross. Now, we have the cross that's on the wall that uh, we mentioned yesterday as we took a little tour of the church, but this is the processional cross. Usually at the beginning of Mass and as we exit at Mass, the server would come in with the cross leading the procession of the ministers uh, as, uh, into, into church for the, for the liturgy that's going to happen. Other things we, we see at times, and we don't see it a lot, but we have this the little thing here. <laughs> what is that? Well, this is, first of all, this is a stand, a stand to hold this stuff. This is an incensor. And what goes in here is some charcoal, and uh, it's usually lit, you know, before uh, it might be used at, at Mass, might be used at Christmas or Easter. Um, it's used at funerals, at the end of a funeral liturgy. And then we have this little thing, comes in different shapes. This is called the boat. In fact, some of them look like a mini boat. And in here is incense, a little spoon, a little incense. And at the appropriate time, the server or deacon would come over and open it up. And then the priest would put some incense in there. And then you'd get this cloud of smoke, cloud of smoke, holy smoke, holy smoke. And uh, it, it's a prayer in a sense that uh, let our prayer rise like incense. To the Lord. And so there's that symbolism of the smoke going up into the air, and it's a symbolism of our prayers going up to the Lord. We have here this big candle, big candle. Now, this big candle has a, a name. Uh, its technical name is the Paschal candle. Some people call it the Easter candle. This candle is first lit at the Easter vigil, the eve of the, of uh, Easter, huh? Holy Saturday, Holy Saturday. And at that service, that Mass, the church is in complete darkness. A fire is lit outside of the church, and in comes the candle, the only light that is lit, complete darkness. The idea that this is Jesus Christ, the light of the world. This is the one who is risen from the dead. And they, the, the procession enters into church after the first Christ our light. There's a second one. And after that second one, everybody in, in the church, in the darkness, has a candle that's unlit. And from this candle now, we light the candles of everyone. Because at baptism, we were called to be the light of Christ. At our baptisms, we rise with Christ from the waters of death. And this candle is used during the Easter season. It would be prominently placed in the area of the church. We call the sanctuary, where the altar and the reading area is. 
It's also used at uh, funerals. It, it's lit for funerals because, it's again, it's that reminder of Jesus Christ, the light of the world, who is risen from the dead and whose life, death, and resurrection we share in by our baptisms. And at the funeral of someone, we need to be reminded of that great gift of eternal life. The other uh, item that's over here, you might have seen this, holds water, holy water, that's blessed at appropriate times. This is called a holy water bucket. Huh. Looks like a bucket, doesn't it? And then we have, we'll call it the sprinkler. It has another name, but we won't get too technical. And obviously, you may have seen this used um, when we have a, a renewal of, of vows for baptism, the Easter Sunday liturgies. We might use it to renew our, our baptismal promises at any time. And we're sprinkled with that holy water. We might use it to, to bless palm. Uh, we also use it in a funeral service where we bless the body of the person who has died. Reminder of their baptism. Reminder that now they share in that gift of life. This, of course, is the, the area, the place where the Word of God is spoken. Usually at Mass on the weekends, we have three readings. We have a reading from the Old Testament, a reading from the New Testament, and a reading from one of the Gospels. However, there are different books that we use here and at other times uh, in, our, in our liturgy, in our prayer together. One of the first books we use is, in this church, we have several different of these, music books. Music books. This is the music book that is normally in the pews for all to use. Sometimes we'll have uh, a program that would have music. But um, we we're called to, to, to pray together and hopefully to sing together too. And so we have uh, a music aid to uh, assist us with that process. In the church, we obviously have different sacraments, and there are different books for each of the sacraments. For instance, this is the book we use with a variety of options in it when we officiate at the wedding of somebody. There's another book we use if we're officiating at a baptism of someone. It's the Order of Baptism. Huh? We have another book, I don't have it here, but the Order of Christian Burial that speaks of and has different parts in it. One for the funeral service, the prayer service that we would do most of the time at the funeral home. The, the second stage being the Mass and the prayers that would go with the Mass, the funeral Mass. And then the, the third uh, step in, in the whole funeral rite would be the prayers, the final commendation at the cemetery. There are usually two books that are used here at the, the lectern. The first book we use is called the lectionary. This is, this is the readings uh, for, for the, uh, the masses. And of course, uh, there's different cycles, different years, different uh, uh, celebrations that are in here. Uh, for Sunday masses, we're in what's called a three-year cycle. So we have three different books. We have book A, book B, book C. This year, right now, we're in, in uh, the, the series or the year A. Um, the reader would approach the altar, read the uh, reading. There's then a responsorial psalm that's usually um, sung. Then we have the second reading. And then you, you'll see that the reader will usually close this book and put it to the side. The reason is is that the priest or deacon would then read the gospel from the book that's called the Book of Gospels. And you will see the deacon walk in with this book at the beginning of Mass and place it on the altar. And then the priest or deacon, uh, before the reading of the gospel, would bring the, re the book over with a little procession and then read one of the four gospels for that weekend. Obviously, there's a prayer book, if you would, for the priest. 
That prayer book is called the Roman Missal. And in this book are basically all the prayers that the church suggests for all the, the Sundays, all the special um, solemnities, feast days and the like, all the special services, masses that could be offered in a church. This is the smaller version, the handheld version. Uh, the other one's a bigger version. Uh, I like this one because I can handle it better. Just as an aside, uh, not everything is in here. For instance, we have what's called Eucharistic prayers, and we'll talk more about this in part three of this video. But there are these Eucharistic prayers that are part of the second half of the Mass. And uh, some of us who are older remember when there was only one Eucharistic prayer. It's what we call Eucharistic prayer one now, but in the uh, former days it was called the Roman Missal, or the Roman Canon, the Canon. And now we have four Eucharistic prayers that are in the book. We have two Eucharistic prayers for reconciliation. We have two for um, children, two Eucharistic prayers for children. On top of that, we have uh, another booklet and there are probably other booklets out there, but this one's called, uh, there's four Eucharistic prayers here, called Eucharistic Prayers for Masses for Various Needs and Occasions. So, uh, you know, like we all pray a little different, not always the same, the church has uh, a variety of options that can be used. We're now going to move over to the altar uh, to share some other items that you would see up around the altar many times. There are many items, vessels, that are used uh, during the Mass. Uh, you, you've seen them, and I'm sure you know some of the names. And in no particular order, I, I'm going to uh, uh, talk about a few of them. First of all, there's this little thing. This is really not, you don't see this a lot, but you might see somebody in church with it. This little round container is called a PYX. P -Y -X. In this container, normally what we do is we put a host in here, a consecrated host, that a communion minister, or even myself as a priest, would use to bring, to transport, if you will, the Eucharist to a homebound person, to, to a sick person. And so we would bring communion uh, in this vessel. We need to obviously respect uh, the Lord. So this one has uh, a little key row, as they say on it. Uh, they have different pictures sometimes, and they come in different sizes, but that's the one we normally use here. During Mass, you'll, you'll notice that uh, there's two containers, just like you have at home. Cruets, they're called. One cruet has wine in it, the other crew uh, it has water in it. And, and these, the server usually brings over and the priest or deacon pours it into the, the chalice. Okay? Now, there are different types of chalices. Could be, who knows what it's made out of. But uh, normally you'll see something that's sort of metallic. And we use these here at church when we're able to have um, the, the reception from the, the chalice, the cup. Okay, so call the chalice, you want to call it the cup, that's fine too. And uh, this is the one we would bring to the folks. We would usually have four, five, six uh, for people who are receiving communion. The priest many times uses a chalice that might be different from the other ones. And it's tradition that a priest usually has his own chalice. Uh, this is my chalice. And this is the dish, the patent dish, as it's called, uh, that goes with it. Uh, I designed this, okay? Um, I lived uh, at the time at Emmitsburg, Maryland, at Mount St. Mary's, and a bunch of us took a, a drive one day down to Baltimore, and uh, a man with uh, much talent who made chalices, made mine, uh, Louis Hupfeld. 
And uh, the, the thing you'll see about this one is it has a, a metal cup to it, but the bottom is made of wood, okay? And uh, it's uh, silver, it's pewter silver plated, if you're ever wondering. It's not gold, it's not gold. Then there's a dish, a patent dish, that goes with it that can hold hosts. My, my, this could hold up to, we have the small hosts, sort of like that. Sometimes they're even smaller, but these are the ones we use here in church for communion. And uh, my, my um, host could probably, or my patent dish could probably hold uh, at least 100, if not close to 200 hosts. And then we usually have a larger host. This is a large one. There are some that are bigger and some that are smaller that the priest, uh, the concelebrants, uh, would use. Because if we're raising this up during Mass, it's easier to see this than to see this. And so we use this. I, I, mine's, mine's a little different. Many priests, um, I've seen this happen, uh, their parents might, be, might gift them with the chalice, as my parents did. Uh, many priests will be given the rings of their parents, and they might uh, use it as a cross, maybe on their chalice, that might use a cross on the bottom part of the uh, uh, of this. Um, I can't think of the name for a second. <laughs> the, the communion dish, okay, the communion dish. And uh, I did something special with mine. I have my my parents' rings on it, but my parents' rings are intertwined, intertwined, because it, it just felt to me that it was a, a much better symbol of my parents, you know, marriage and, and their love for one another and their family uh, to have this, a love that hopefully uh, reflects to the best of our abilities here on earth, the love of God, that really uh, we, we are all called to share in some way or ways in every, any an area of life that we, we are. We have another communion dish, a smaller one, that Again, we have several of these. So when the Eucharistic ministers are helping with the distribution of the Eucharist to the, to the people, uh, they would have a dish here um, to take their host to, to the people. Then we have this big, big, big communion dish. Okay, This is the one we usually use here. Uh, I don't always use my, uh, uh, my, my communion dish. The reason all the hosts would go in here Okay, so if there's 300 hosts in here, they all would go in here. And then uh, later in the Mass, uh, during the Lamb of God, we would distribute those into the smaller dishes for distribution to the people. Um, just as a sort of a side, uh, we have a couple other things. We have this little thing here. It's called a purificator. Okay, so you might see the priest use it. You know, he, he might walk, wipe off the, the rim of his chalice. The Eucharistic ministers who are distributing the chalice, they too would have one. And as you receive, they would then wipe the chalice and then turn the chalice just a little bit so that we can try to be as sanitary as possible. The other thing that you'll see during the middle of Mass, uh, the preparation of the gift times, um, the priest has his hands washed. So we have a little bowl, could be smaller, could be bigger. We use water, obviously, a little, little water in there. And then um, we have a towel, just like you would have at home. Okay, so um, th those are, are just a, a few things that we, we have in church. Um, there might be other things, but hopefully this gets you a little bit familiar with some of the items that are in church. So uh, we thank you for watching this second part. And, and, uh, take a little break now before you watch the third part. But I got a question to ask you before we enter into the third part. And we'll talk about this when we get, come back. When does Mass begin? When does Mass begin? Great question. We'll see you in part three in a little bit. Thanks.